continue this discussion that we had and started last week with religion versus a relationship. Um, religion is something you do or something that you practice or something that you feel required to uphold and to walk a certain way and to perform a certain way. Uh, it's all about the rules. Um, religion is all about you uh, are part of a group because you do the same things that that group does. And it doesn't mean that it has any meaning for you. That's just what we do. That's what religion is. And we talked about that last week. But uh, So we'll just review real quickly that last week... Uh, and please remember, this is not a message of condemnation and it's not a message of, you know, that we want to bring you here and judge you or that we, you know, are talking about religion with indignation. We're really not. The whole purpose is that we realize there's a difference between religion and a relationship. Amen. Amen? Because, uh, you know, think of it in this way. Can a marriage survive when it's all just the outward Oh, well, this is what we do because we're married. Not a happy marriage. A relationship involves two people participating in the relationship. Religion, on the other hand, is a list of rules and regulations that as long as you follow, you're fine. That's a problem, isn't it, in our everyday life? So we looked at last week the difference between religion and a relationship. So... Uh, last week we said that religion was man's attempt. Now, if this fits you, look, I, I can't tell you how to change. I can't give you the right formula for you. Uh, I, I just can tell you the truth of God's word. And then you just have to let the Holy Spirit deal with you and, and where you're at. Okay. It's not important what I think. It's not important that, oh, well, they don't live up to my standard. My standard is useless. It will do nothing for you. The only standard that matters is the standard of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so we want to look at that. So last week we said that religion was man's attempt to earn God's favor or their own righteousness with their own vain works. Any of you ever been there? Right? Doing the deal. Right? Walking the walk. Talking the talk. Sometimes not walking the walk. Right? We've all been there. Right? Right? Uh, many of us still react there because of how we were raised or because of things that we've been taught without opening the Word of God ourselves and finding out ourselves. So that's what religion is. When the Bible says it's impossible for us to earn that righteousness. Look at Romans 3, 9, and 10. This is what we talked about last week. What then are we better than they? Paul is talking about the difference between Jews and Gentiles. And he says, no, in no wise, for we have before proved both Gen Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Your religion doesn't do anything for you. Jew or Gentile, if you're not born again, you're all under sin. If you're not a believer, you're under sin. It's just, it, it, it's one of those things. It's either it is or it isn't. And so I can't walk a gray line or a fence for you. It's just one or the other. So if you're a believer, you're not under sin. If you're an unbeliever, then you're under sin. So if you're a believer and you're trying to work for your own relationship and righteousness, you're, you're walking the wrong, the wrong walk. As a non-believer, no actions you ever do will change the fact that you're under sin. Only a relationship will change those that are and those that are not under sin. So look at this, how it finishes. Uh, that they are all under sin, as it is written, the believers and you know, those that go to the Baptist church, the Catholic church, the Presbyterian church, the Episcopal church, New Creation church, uh, this church, that church, that faith, this faith, that faith, they have a little righteousness. How many are righteous? None. Listen, apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, righteousness does not exist. 
That's exactly what Paul's telling you. Doesn't matter if you're black or white, Jew or Gentile, free or slave, uh, whether you go to the Baptist church, the Episcopal church, or New Creation church, apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, righteousness does not exist. So religion is a lie. Because religion, as we looked at last week, tries to teach you to walk in a certain path and do certain actions. And because you do those, now you have righteousness attributed to you. But that would be unscriptural, wouldn't it? Because that right there says there is none righteous. No, not one. So, okay, that was last week. This week, <clears throat> we're going to talk about being in a relationship with Jesus, not religion. If you came here to observe religion, we're probably not going to be your cup of tea. Because I don't really do religion. Um, I don't really do judgment and condemnation and indignation, you know, and sinners that sin. And then I'm all angry because they sin. Well, they're sinners. Of course they sin. When I was a sinner, I sinned. But when I became saved, I get angry now at other people that sin because, you know, I'm better. See, we miss a whole part that it had nothing to do with me. And it was all about my relationship with him. Amen. Amen. So we're going to look at that relationship <clears throat> this week. In a relationship with Jesus. So what exactly is a relationship? Now, we normally in our, you know, as we're thinking of a relationship, we, we believe it generally takes two, right? Can a husband and wife be in a relationship and the husband does everything? And it work? No. Can we be in a relationship and the wife does everything and it work? No. Not without its issues, right? Yeah. Now, you're fortunate I'm not going to talk about the marriage today because my wife's here. If she weren't here, I'd be all over it. No, that's not true. I'm not, you, know, you know the one thing that Jesus, or that the Apostle Paul, and, and through the Holy Spirit, he, he reflects as the relationship between a believer and Jesus Christ? The marriage. Read Ephesians 6, Ephesians chapter 5. It's all about the relationship between, as you're reading it, you think, oh, this is a husband and wife, and this is how the relationship is. But at the very end, Paul says, I speak of the mystery of Christ and the church. Amen. So when we talk about a relationship, for most of us, our mind says, okay, there's two people involved, and there's give and take, right? There's give and take. And it's, it's, it's just the situation. The problem is, is that here... Our relationship with Jesus also has give and take. The issue is, is it's Jesus is the one who gives. It's Jesus that does all the giving. Amen. Hey, it's important you understand that. You know why? Because when you fail to give, if you think it's about you giving, and when you fail to give, you feel failure in your life. And that failure in your life brings that condemnation and that judgment, which you're no longer under that burden. This relationship between you and Jesus Christ is about Jesus was the one who gave it all. And it's up to us to take the truth, that, uh, to accept that offer of a relationship with him. Do you know that when he died and shed his blood and was buried and rose again the third day, the gospel, right? We read that, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. When we read that and understand that gospel, do you know that the entire world... That gospel is true even for them. Well, what about the Muslims? Oh, yeah, it's true for them too. Amen. What about the Hindus? Oh, yeah, it's true for them too. Amen. The difference is what? Whether they have accepted that truth or not. Amen. The fact that they're Hindu or Muslim or Buddhist or whatever makes no difference. It has no effect on the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Their sins have all been forgiven too if they will only receive the truth of Jesus Christ and what he did for mankind. So it's real important that we understand that this relationship that we have with Christ is about you receiving the truth of his death, burial, and resurrection for the purchasing or the reconciling your relationship back with God. That's the whole thing. So... Ephesians 2, 13 through 18. I love this right here, but now. You know why? Because but now tells you something happened. Something changed. It was one way, 
but now it's this way. So whenever you see that in scripture, make note of it. Because what he's saying is there's a flip side. This is how it used to be, but now it's this way. All right, so it used to be one way, and then Paul is saying here, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off are made near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. Your actions, is it your actions? Is it your daily living? Is it your religion? Is it got anything to do? Who's our peace? He's our peace. How many of us have been relying on our family, our spouse, our pastor, our church brothers and sisters in Christ for peace? You know, it's, it's the truth. The truth is that's what we do. But they're not your peace. He is your peace. See, that can only happen in a relationship with him. Your religion will never give you the truth of he is our peace. You'll never understand he is our peace when you're dealing in religion. Because religion says that your peace comes through your actions. But the Bible says that our peace comes through him and the blood that he shed for us. Amen. So look at this. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who has made both one, speaking of Jew and Gentile, and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us. If you know anything about what I teach, that there was a time when God was dealing only with Jews, and then he was Gentiles. His economy was Jews and Gentiles. There's only two people on the face of the planet, Jews and Gentiles. But through the blood of Jesus Christ, he broke down that partition so that in this age of grace, he's now dealing with everybody the same. Okay, that's what this is. So he says, broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh, the enmity, all right, or the, that thing which is against, okay, the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, uh, it's speaking about the law, for to make in himself, still speaking of Jesus Christ, of two, one new man. So making peace. See, you're no longer at odds in a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no longer, how many of you have felt like before, even though you believe you're a believer, but you felt like, you know what, there's, there's some you know, conflict between me and the Lord. Something is going on and it's causing conflict. No, 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 see, that's unscriptural. The conflict is what you bring up in your imaginations, which tends to be towards religious acts. Oh, I didn't go to church enough. I didn't read my Bible enough. Oh, I haven't gone and I'm not helping with this and I'm not doing that. And so you feel guilty and conflicted at, at what Jesus has said is your peace. And so you inadvertently make it at that word enmity against what Jesus is saying. No, 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 it's all free. It's all clear. You're all good. How many of you would love to learn and live your life knowing that Jesus is basically saying to me, when you have a relationship with me, you are okay Amen. right oh I don't have to do this no no you're okay yep. oh I don't have to go out and do this no no you're okay you're because of your relationship with him you are okay Amen. does that not give you some freedom in how you live and walk in your life oh pray to I just didn't get to read my bible enough I promise you you're not alone and let me tell you what the bible says who is your teacher in the Word of God? The Holy Spirit. Not the time you spend, although the truth is, if you want to know the Word of God, you must read the Word of God. I mean, that's obvious. If I wanted to go learn about, you know, uh, um, Gulliver's Travels, I would have to read Gulliver's Travels, or at least the Cliff Notes. Right? That's why some of us come to church, so we can get the Cliff Notes on the Bible. Hey, it's important that you don't put your trust in what I'm telling you. It's important that you put your trust in your relationship with him. Right. You open that word of God and I promise you he will teach you truth. Are you going to make mistakes? Oh, yeah. How do I know? Been there. Done that. All right. I didn't get to where I am without battles. I didn't get to understand the truth of grace without shedding a whole bunch of religion. Yeah. 
that I've dealt with for most of my life as a believer. It's just a truth of, of growing and maturing in the Spirit of God as He leads us and teaches us through the truth. You're going to have those things that you're, not, you're conflicted about because you've been taught this way, and the Bible says this way. That's a, that's a conflict for you. But the relationship takes precedence over the teaching. The relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to trust that He is going to teach you His Word. Verse 16. And that uh, He might, what? What's that word? Reconcile. The whole purpose that He died for you is He wants to have that relationship that, that, that He had in, in, in the Garden of Eden. God desires that relationship to be restored. So, even before the Garden of Eden, he knew that for reconciliation to occur, his son would have to come down, take on flesh, uh, and live the life of a sinless being and give himself freely to die, shed his blood, and be buried and rose again the third day in order to reconcile mankind to God the Father. Now, does that sound like somebody that's going to be beating you up when you're trying to rest in him and in what he did? Quit putting the, the, the burden of religion when really what you have is a relationship. In a relationship, God's desire is to be reconciled to you, to constantly be communicating and to building that relationship between you and him. He has no desire for religion. You remember last week we looked at Isaiah chapter 1? God said that the burnt offerings were a stench, the, that the incense was a stench to him. He's like, who's telling you to tread my courts? What are you doing here? Because everything they were observing, even though God had told them to do it, it had become mundane in this mechanical action. That's what we do on Sunday. There's no relationship there. That's all religion. But he wants to be reconciled. To be reconciled in a relationship that there is love. Amen. And when he pours out that love through his son Jesus Christ and you form that relationship with his son Jesus Christ then you automatically begin to learn when you're free in Christ and you understand what actually trans... When you're working for your forgiveness, when you're working for the things you're going on, are you really attributing all this love back to Christ? No, because you earned it, right? Hey, I did that, man. I earned that. I mean, I know it's free, but I earned it. We have to be very careful that we don't mix those up when we're talking religion versus relationship. Relationship then becomes an action out of love and not out of duty. If you're here out of duty, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, you're struggling with religion. But if you're here out of love, now you're involved in the relationship that Jesus Christ wishes to have with believers. Amen? Verse 16, And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain or destroyed that enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you. How many of you in, steeped in religion felt peace? Whew, it's hard, isn't it? Oh, you got to do this, you got to be there, you got to do that. And you know, if you don't go do that, if you don't go do this ministry, or you don't go do that ministry, oh man, it's like, give me a break. And we wonder why people become the frozen chosen. They become the frozen chosen in the church because you know what? They might as well be dead. Because there's no joy, there's no love, there's no peace. It's all about the work. And we need to understand that with Christ, it's all about the relationship. Amen? And not about the work. I promise you, if, if you nurture the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ, the work, it won't even be a work. It'll be a joy. It'll be an experience. And you'll be giving back because that's who you are. Not because what you do out of duty. Amen? <clears throat> so what did Jesus give for this relationship? Colossians 1.20 And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him, Jesus Christ, to reconcile how many things? Oh, oh, how many of you know your past enough to know that, you know what? I don't deserve to be reconciled to anybody. Well, amen. Right? 
I should not be included in that statement, but it says he reconciled what? All things. All right? So you get off your high horse and realize that he loves you so much, he reconciled you. When you receive the truth, the testimony that God gave of his son, you became reconciled. Everything about you, your past, reconciled. Amen. Your future, reconciled. Amen. Everything that used to destroy you as a person looking for a relationship with Christ was reconciled through the cross. Once you accepted the testimony that God gave of his son, that reconciliation was complete. Jesus isn't struggling with it at all. Who is? You're struggling with it. Not Jesus. Amen? So by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, whether they be the things in earth or the things of heaven, Colossians 2.14, you need to get this in your mind. How many of you struggle with your past? Just me? Just the pastor? The rest of you are good? Okay, so how many of you have struggled with lying? Right, we all struggle with our past, don't we? Because we know what we used to be. We know the things we used to do. But I want to show you this verse. Because if you'll, if you'll just live here, this will really help you in your day-to-day -day life, all right? Colossians 2.14, that through the cross, Jesus Christ dying and uh, being buried and raising again, that when he hung on the cross, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, which was contrary to us and took it what? This word in the Greek, this... this this uh, remark that took it out of the way means it was removed completely and it is no longer an obstruction. So who's making it a, an obstruction? Yeah, or our religion. Right, because religion is all about the past. Religion is all about the traditions. Hey, traditions are fine in their place, but they have no place in the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. If you're doing anything because... It's what we've always done. It's something you should really take a look at. Because if it's not about exhorting him, if it's not about lifting him up, then there's an issue. So we want to pay attention to that. Traditions are fine in their place, but they have no part of the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. Because you need to understand that you were set free through the blood that he paid, right? So it said that he took it out of the way and he nailed it to his cross. Amen? Amen. So what did he give? He gave everything. Amen. Amen? So here is our responsibility. I really want you to see this. Listen, this is, this is what you do as a believer. And I want you to see how difficult this is. Okay. To receive the testimony that God gave of his son, first of all, you didn't do anything. All you have to do is receive it. There's no work involved. You don't have to go to so many classes. You don't have to go through some kind of teaching. You don't have to do any of that stuff. The only thing you have to do is receive the truth of what he did. Amen. That just seems wrong, right? Because we all know there's nothing free in life. This one was. But truly, truly, this is free. What he did in order to reconcile man to God is free. Amen. And it's about you receiving this testimony that God gave of his son. <clears throat> 1 John 5, 9, if we receive the witness of men... The witness of God is greater. Right. That's right. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his son. Amen. Allow the love of Christ to guide and direct our actions. Again, tough one, right? This, this is all about your work. It has nothing to do about, with your work. It's still all about him. Listen, having a relationship with Jesus Christ is the easiest thing you will ever do in your life. Learning how to live in that freedom and liberty, whole different story. Because we are prone to want to be slave to religion. Because our, our, our man, our consciousness tells us that we have to earn everything. When the relationship with Christ says that he did everything and gave it to us. So your struggle isn't that Jesus didn't do everything. Your struggle is that you think you need to earn it. So let's stay there. Allow the love of Christ to guide and direct our actions. 2 Corinthians 5.14 For the love of Christ constrains. Now this word means guides. 
it, it, it shows us, it directs us, okay? For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we are all what? Hey, that old person is gone, right? Second Corinthians 5, 17, behold, all things have passed away. All things have become new, right? Everyone who's in Christ Jesus is a new creation. This is exactly why. This is why, because he paid the price. You don't have to work at being new. You are new in a relationship with Jesus Christ. See, that religion doesn't give you that. Religion gives you a weight and a burden to carry around with you. Where a relationship gives you liberty and freedom to walk and, and to rest in Christ Jesus. Amen? Let's keep going. <clears throat> our responsibility in this relationship to receive our place in the body. This is important because most of us think we have to find our place in the body. Yeah. <laughs> That's a problem because you know what? Most of us find the wrong place in the body. And then we wonder why there's turmoil and why there's, why there's division in the body. Well, because I'm trying to be the nose when God intended me to be the eyebrow. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Because I'm deciding where I go in the body. But that's not what the scripture says. In the body of Christ... Where we are placed is decided by him. 1 Corinthians 12, 18. But now has God set members, every one of them, in the body as it pleases the pastor? No. As it pleases our denomination? No. As it pleases who? Yeah. Listen, if you're trying to you know, make a place for you in the body, you're going to destroy your relationship because it becomes work to you. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is allow the Holy Spirit to move you into the position that God has chosen for you already. Right. How many of you think I, 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 when I got saved, my ideal would be that I would be a pastor? I don't think so. <laughs> Even when the Lord called me to be a pastor, I ran for 12 years. Didn't want anything to do with it. And even when I finally submitted and said, okay, Lord, we'll go where you tell us to go and we'll do what you tell us to do, I, for the first time, stepped out in faith. Do you know what that did to my family? Hey, let me tell you something. Walking in faith is dangerous. You know why? Because God will turn your life upside down because you think you need something. He's like, no, no, I got that. You think you got to do something. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. Remember, I, I got that. And so the only thing that fit for me was to let go and allow the Lord to move me into the position that he had for me in the body. Now that's changed throughout my Christian walk. You know, I've been a Sunday school teacher. I've been, and it's not like this progression, you know, oh, he's finally getting up there. It's not like that at all. You know, the truth is, is I've just learned to quit fighting the Lord and just realize that he loves me He's not going to put me in anything that I'm not able to handle. It doesn't matter what's going on. He will have control of what the outcome is. I just have to love him enough and trust that relationship enough to rest there. Amen. So let's keep going. Understand our ministry in Christ. Uh, 517, 2 Corinthians 517 through 20. And all things are of God who, God, has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Listen, how many of you would, would like to know what you're supposed to do as a believer? The, here you go. You never again have to worry about what you're supposed to do. Now, what role the Lord uses you in that, you just be attentive to the Holy Spirit and he'll train you up and he'll teach you where you need to be. But listen to the truth of this. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses <coughs> unto them and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You want to know why we only talk about love here? That. You want to know why we allow anybody through these doors that comes through? Gay, prostitute, drug addict, alcoholic, porn addict, I don't care who they are, lost, saved, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, I don't care. You know why? 
because of that. Amen. My only purpose is to share the word of, of the ministry of reconciliation. And here's that word. It's very simple. The word is, is that while they're still in their sins, Christ died for them. Amen. And that the whole purpose of Christ dying for them is that God wants to have a relationship with them. Anything outside of that, I'm leaving this ministry given to me. I'm leaving this task that Paul says in 1 Corinthians that the Lord gave to the body. When we leave love and start moving in works, we have left the ministry of reconciliation. As a body of believers, as a group of believers, we are now... The opening ourselves up and making ourselves susceptible to all kinds of influences and things that can harm the body. We need to deal in the ministry that God left for us. That ministry is to go to the lost world and through the love of Christ, explain to them that Jesus Christ died for them and that while they're still in their sin, he loves them and wants a relationship with them. Oh, what about they got to dress like me? That's not in there. What about they have to do a 12-step program? <clears throat> That's not in there. What if we have to do a certain amount of classes? What about we have to dunk them? We have to dip them? We have to, you know, shake them up and rip them? I don't know. You know it's not in there. Our responsibility is to take this ministry of reconciliation and let the lost world know that Jesus loves them. He died for them. It's already there. All they have to do is receive it. Amen. That's exactly what this verse says. Finish it off. To, to it that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing, meaning not holding against them, their trespasses or sins unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, <coughs> as though God did beseech you, which is like ask you or beg you, all right, by us, us body, by us, by us, we pray or beg you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. You don't ever again have to worry about what your ministry is. Your ministry is to love people like Jesus did. Yep. Amen. Tell them the truth of Jesus Christ, that he died for them, that he shed his blood for them, he was buried and rose again the third day, that they might have newness of life, that they never again have to worry about their sin, they never again have to worry about hell, they never again have to worry about their death. See, that's only in a relationship. Religion cannot do that for you. Amen. Religion cannot do that for you. We're going to stop here. I want to share with you a couple things about this relationship that we have. You see, this freedom that we have is because we have to reach out and, and accept, receive that freedom. How many of you have problems getting gifts from people? Isn't it funny that that's so weird, right? We don't necessarily mind buying somebody a gift, but when they give us a gift, it's like, uh, oh, you know, well, you didn't have to do that. And, uh, you know, I, I really now I got to go buy them something. No. See, we make it a work, don't we? <laughs> but in a relationship, how many of you, when you buy for your children, do you expect them to give you something back? That's not why you do it, is it? No. You, <clears throat> excuse me, you do it out of a love for your children. That's right. Guess what? <clears throat> Besides, I'm choking. That's exactly, <coughs> exactly what God does for his children. He just gives and gives and gives and gives. You have to learn to receive the blessing. You have to learn to receive that truth and then walk in that truth. Don't think that you have to go and do something now. Oh, God gave me this, so I got to go do this with it. Hey, I promise you, if God gave it to you to give to someone else, God's going to tell you. Yep. And then <clears throat> if you decide to do what God told you to do, he'll keep giving. And if you decide not to do what God told you to do, he'll still keep giving. That's right. Amen. See, don't put your religion on him. Oh, I didn't do it, so he's going to take it back from me. No, no, no. God's God, man, all the time. Because if, if, if your action caused him to change his action, then really... <clears throat> Could he truly say that all sin been forgiven? Could he say that we're never again under sin if that was the action that when I made, <clears throat> made a mistake that then he changes his behavior? That would be a problem, right? So let's rest in the truth of the relationship with Jesus Christ. It is all about him. 
And yes, he did give everything. And yes, we took everything. But don't take it with bitterness and don't take it like you owe something. Simply take it and receive what he's given. Let's pray.